are here with the Manson brothers. I got Mike and I got Chris. How are you guys doing today? Good, Lance. Fantastic, How man, Lance. Thanks for having us on. I, well, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. Uh, I'm actually really glad I get to talk to you guys. I was there as well for the premiere at Flashback Weekend. So just real quick, you guys kind of get into how did you get into Flashback Weekend with this movie and how was it seeing it with the crowd for the first time? Um, well, so Flashback actually came about because Mike Carey and Mike Kurz, who, who runs Flashback, used to work in a movie theater together, correct, Mike? In the 80s, yeah. <laughs> the 80s. Mike, Mike Kurz was a manager of the Golf Glen Theater in Niles, where I used to work when I was a teenager. And we've been friends for, what, 36 years? So it's a long time. And Mike has had run, been running Flashback now for... Uh, Almost 20 years, right? 20, 20 years. I think yeah. this was the 20 year anniversary. And I've done work for him as a security for like when he would have a big star come in or whatever, because I did bodyguard work, you know, he would, uh, he would ask me to come and help him out, which I was more than glad to do because I got to hobnob with the celebrities and I didn't have to pay to get in. Uh, plus I, <laughs> I love horror movies and I love memorabilia. And Mike always has a great variety of vendors there. So anyway, um, they had been aware of our film. They let us graciously have a table back in 2017 when Chris and I were trying to raise funds for the movie. And we were there just sort of, you know, raising awareness about it. And hey, we've got the script and we're going to make it. It's kind of cool. And uh, we made some contacts with some people there that still, you know, have followed us all the way, all the way through. So that was really neat. So uh, this year, just on a lark, because it was getting distributed right around the time Mike was having it. I told Chris, I'm like, you know what? I wonder if we should hit up uh, Mike Kurz and see if he'd be interested in screening it. If Gravitas, our distributor will allow it. Well, they thought it was a great idea. And Mike really you know, was, was great about it. He really rolled the red carpet out for us and, and he promote him and Mia, me and his wife and, uh, and they really treated us well and yeah. set up the screening and <clears throat> set up the after party and the VIP thing and the photo ops. And then we were able to bring in DB Sweeney and Randy Couture, uh, which, you know, was great for everybody. Um, you know, Boz Rutten and Adrian Pazdar were going to show up, but they each had a conflict and then Max was going to come, but then he had a conflict. So unfortunately we couldn't get everybody, but we got those guys and we got interviewed by Spenguli, which was like, Oh my God. I mean, that was like, the, you know, as I know, no, you know, if you're not a horror fan from Chicago or you're not a horror fan now and you don't know who Sven Gulli is to me that and I've met a lot of celebrities in my time as an actor that I never fan out for anybody. And I was fanning out speechless. I, yeah, I, I felt like I was 10 years old. Yeah. I, I was like a little yeah. kid again. And um, I've been watch. I watched his first show in 1979 and I even watched the original Sven Gulli, who was Jerry G Bishop back in the early seventies um, before uh, uh, the son of, and then now currently Sven Gulli took over in 79. So that was awesome. And what is your history together? Cause I know obviously you've known each other for a while and you've you mentioned wrestling. You kind of get into that where you both came from and, and how, obviously a, a lifelong friendship or at least a, a long friendship that you guys have had it ended up basically being the, the cornerstone of this film. Mike probably doesn't remember this. He does now because I've talked about it a few times, but he was the first guy that I met when I rolled into Windy City Wrestling to go to their training school. Back no, I in, met, I, we were sitting on the bench. Yeah, 19, 1996 or something like that. And we were having a conversation. And, and uh, fortunately, I could talk to Mike because he was a fighter and I had trained in Muay Thai. So that was kind of our yeah, connection right away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so that, that was, a, that was a good opener. Um, we never actually wrestled together. What wound up happening uh, very fortuitous for me was Mike who had been a superstar. And, and by the way, when you walk into a locker room and you see Mike Carey in there, uh, you know, I was like, maybe I'm in the wrong place. I should, I, I might want to be doing something else. Um, not now then uh, but it was it was it was impressive and his and his tag team partner at the time was even more impressive iron mike sampson but anyway um, <laughs> he, he, was, he was a chicago legend yeah. but uh so when mike was when mike was transitioning out to get into the fire department he suggested to the to his other partners who were the brotherhood slash the manson brothers that they that they take me as his replacement 
And so, uh, you know, the promoter called me and said, how'd you like to do this? And I went through all these things about how, wow, you know, guys are leaving. Is it a problem? And when all my buddies started telling me, don't join the brotherhood, don't join the brotherhood. That was when I was like, I'm joining the brotherhood (laughs) because I knew they were telling me for a reason. And it worked out because it it transitioned me from an up and comer into, you know, a main eventer almost immediately. So from then, Mike and I were always kind of connected, but he, he was on the outside. It wasn't until... Um, I had done a, a really small uh, Frankenstein film in Chicago, uh, very low budget, but you know, guys, listen, everybody's working hard no matter what There's the dollars no small are. You know? jobs. Yeah, exactly. So ha- hats off to all those guys in Chicago that I worked with on that. But, but I was living out here and Mike had a buddy who was a projectionist at the theater where we had screened this Frankenstein film. Uh, he sends me a text and says, man, I- I'm watching this movie and the guy in it looks exactly like you. Are, are you in a Frankenstein movie? And I was like, yes, I am. Um, fast forward a little bit from there. Mike was on a TV series called Crisis that shot in Chicago with Max Martini. Mike came out to visit him, calls me up, says, hey, you want to meet up with us? We start talking. This is the part. So this is the part of the story that has not been told the entire time. I'm going to make it very brief. We all have a couple cocktails at this place in, in, uh, in Studio City. It's outside. Sportsman's the crowd is, Lodge. Yeah, the sports, Sportsman's Lodge. The crowd starts to build and build and build. And finally, Mike's like, I got a really early flight tomorrow. I got to get out of here. Okay, so we all get up to leave. And he says to me, hey, you want to lock up for old time's sake? And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Boom, we lock up. We go into the spot and we look around and the place is going bananas. From the same Everybody's watching. They thought we were beating yeah. the shit out of each other. Right, but it was, it was just a wrestling thing. So he takes off. I go home the next morning. I get a call from him. He's like, my flight got canceled. Uh, I was talking to Max. He went crazy over that thing that we did. We got to do something. Like we, I, I got this idea. And, and from there, that idea took off. And, and really, I mean, not that we didn't have a relationship before, but our relationship really blossomed from working on this project. I think one of the things coming from wrestling, we both have a very similar storytelling mentality. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I love about working with Mike is we really complement each other very well. Like I think the things that he's really good at, I'm more deficient in and vice versa. Um, But through that, we, we really just kind of developed this, this relationships. It's very much like the brothers. I I, I tell him he's an idiot all the time, uh, which is great. So no, I'm kidding about that, but um, it's true. That's a long way to tempo too. We have like a good, like a rhythm, you know, like he, I'll come up with some stuff and he'll come up with some stuff. Um, it, it just, com- we just compliment each other very well. And neither of us says this to the other person. No, yeah, we never say right, like, no. We're not going to do that. You know? No, we, we never say we're not going to do that. What we say is, well, let's plug it in and see if it works. And then what usually <clears throat> winds up happening is we'll take an idea of mine or an idea of his, we put it in there And we start working it and then it becomes something totally unique after that. But it's because, you know, you have this process of saying yes, yes, yes. And then you go through the trial and error. And then if it doesn't work and it doesn't work, but then you've, you've done it together and you're like, Hey, okay, this is a bomb. And usually you'll see that. And you have to, we, we, each of us takes the ego out of it, but it's really great to work with him because he does compliment the things that I lack. And I, feel like compliments the things that he might be like and we learn from each other and it's really great because although we have a similar sense of humor we have different styles of it mm-hmm. and the styles work really well together and they it creates something totally different I, I will say this too we did a ton of pre-production work getting into the stuff with max i mean he spent a lot of time with us finding kind of the the you know the zone I- of the, the, the conversations, you know, I, I think, I think us having worked together and knowing each other as well as we did really assisted in that process. Um, but he, but he spent a lot of time, uh, you know, getting us to where I think we needed to be for, you know, to make everything. He said it like, if you don't commit to the, to what you're saying fully as though it's like, if you try to make it funny, it's never going to be funny. If you, if, if you try to make it, kind of straight played i think that's where the the humor comes into it and and yeah. there's a you know there's i think there's a, a brotherly you know banter in in a in a not playful way but more of a 
uh, you know, yeah, like if, you're, the, if you have siblings, you'll recognize the bickering. Yeah. You've done it, you know. And Max, a lot of times, his one direction that he used to give us all the time was just throw it away. Just yeah. throw it away. Say it like it doesn't mean anything. Don't say it like it's a punchline. You just yeah. throw it away. And I think nine out of ten times that really worked well for us. And I made it because that's the way I I like to do it too. And you know, one of the things we really wanted to get to too was we wanted the idea of these two characters that when they actually got into it, it did not matter what was going on around them. There could be a zombie apocalypse happening, and they were going to focus on telling each other whether they were right. Yeah, or wrong. they were going to bicker. You no, know, yeah, no matter what. And that was that was kind of the you know the idea behind the two brothers was. These two guys are such morons. One of them thinks he's really smart and he is smarter than the other one. Right. But, but you know, they're dumb enough that if there's really something important happening, but they've got something going on, it's, it's going to take a backseat, you know? So. Yeah. It's, it's these two morons that no matter what happens, they, for some reason, they, they come up, wind up in a pile of shit and come out smelling like a rose. So that's, you know, and it's only because they're together and they're able to, you know, they're just, they're blissfully unaware of any other <laughs> thing that's going on. And, yeah. and uh, if you read the original, like, uh, screenplay, there's a lot of stuff in there we had to take out. That was, it was super funny. We just didn't have time to do it. And there's a lot of other big zombie battles we actually had to take out because of budgetary constraints and time. And like, we, yeah. he and I rewrote the entire probably rewrote almost the entire thing in the week leading up to the shooting. We were, him and I were cranking pages out with Max too. And we were, the three of us were just cranking this thing out and cranking this thing out and cranking this thing out. And it'd be like, and then Max would be like, uh, guy, he'd call us at our house and he'd be like, uh, uh, this isn't going to work. You have to change it. And me and me, I'm like, all right, let's go. We'd open the computer up and me and him. And within hours we'd fix it, which would usually, I mean, that takes, it takes weeks sometimes. That, that was, it was very interesting in that from the writing perspective, uh, we did a lot of work the day of, you know, we would, we would literally make changes on the day, um, depending on, you know, whatever circumstance was going on, but it was, it was, it was fun too. I mean, it's, it's, I think again, one of the things you get from wrestling is you got to improvise a lot and you got to be able to come up with stuff kind of, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting that we spent years writing the script, you know, and then we and, had to do it all. And a month before we had to change it from Chicago to, to New Mexico, you know, so so that was a big alteration. And, and you know, there were there were a lot of interesting things. Any bigger changes? I'm always kind of curious because I know that as much as people always think that the, the script that's written ends up on screen. I, I, yeah, much, I'll give yeah. you one real big one. I got two. Yeah, well, maybe <laughs> mine is probably the same as yours, but originally <laughs> when we wrote the thing, the Manson brothers were masked wrestlers who never took the masks off. So in the movie, you never see our faces until the very end of the film. And the reason we did that, we did it by design. The first was, I'm a big fan of uh, Santo the Wrestler films. And I always thought it was, it was funny and interesting that even though these films are cheap and they're kind of cheesy, but they're, they're endearing and they have a big heart, but he would be at a gourmet restaurant in his <laughs> silver wrestling mask with his cape and everything bare chested or in a tuxedo with his silver wrestling mask. And nobody notices. Like they're just having a conversation, like nothing's going on. And, and I'm like, that's how I want it to be. I want it to be so weird, but that the weirdness is accepted. So we wrote this. And, and also because we were older and because we didn't have names, we felt it would be a good way for us to justify casting ourselves in the role because nobody sees our faces. So who cares if it's not, you know, uh, Ben Affleck and George Clooney, nobody gives a crap because you don't, you never see them. And then I thought at the end, when we finally take them off, whether you liked the movie or hated the movie, you'd want to see what these two dopes looked like. So, but getting in the production, we found out, we, so we were doing all the comedy and laughing our asses off. Once we put the masks on, it killed the comedy. It killed it. So then, I mean, this is like a week before we go to shoot and me and him are like, crap. So we had to sit down. We had a couple all nighters. We had to rewrite the whole thing because then we had to have excuses to put the masks on and take them off because we didn't want to do away with them all together. And, um, and you know, that's by the way, the masks are the masks are blue and silver for a reason. 
it's because of Santo and Blue Demon wore yes. uh, silver and blue in the films. The homage. So that, that's our homage to Blue Demon and Santo. What can you tell me about the Manson Brothers satanic uh, vampire death vampire match? Death match. Yes, because uh, I know okay. that that's a little hit. It's it's a little joke. No, the movie's no. been written. It's written. It's been yeah, it's, written. It's been revised. We were supposed to have shot it already. We were three uh, weeks from leaving to shoot the film before COVID hit. Right. Um, and, then, and then and then COVID kind of knocked out our financing for it. So it, it's it's ready to go. I mean, we were we were ready. To, and I think, quite honestly, now every writer you know, thinks his last thing is the best thing, right? Or whatever he's working on. Um, but, but one of the interesting things is, is <clears throat> when you make a film, um, especially with the guys that are the level that we were fortunate enough to do it with, you learn so much that you don't know. And I think we were really able to kind of put that into, you know, what we wrote the second time around. Uh, I think the other thing was, was, um, you know, through the miracle of software and having so much time, uh, during COVID, <laughs> we we got to collaborate so much. And when you actually kind of act out the stuff that's on the paper, it's amazing how much different sometimes it sounds saying it versus, yeah. you know, typing it out and reading it and thinking, ha, ha, ha. And then you say it and you're like, oh, my God, man, that's that just sucks. Yeah. Right? <laughs> there was a lot of times we thought stuff was like, oh, this is Seriously, gold. You'd and then we're acting it out and we're like, oh, right. man. We'd be like, dude, that just sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and, and then we were able to clip it. Um, and, and I think, I think you know, we, the, the big thing is, is we, we keep the mass involved. We never want to truly give away if, if that's, you know, we, we try to keep it as vague as possible as to, are they really helping in any way, shape or form? Is it in our head? Or is it coincidence? What's the situation? Is it coincidental? And so we explore that a little bit more. Um, I, I think, uh, I think it, there's even more action. Um, oh, interestingly, action wise. I think here's here's one a very interesting thing, and this is this is some super kind of inside baseball. One of the things we heard from a distributor that was very interested in our first film was. Uh, that said, hey, we're also very interested because you're doing a second one, but we'd really like you to ramp up the gore factor in the second one, right? So we went to work making the script just much more um, descriptive. And you've seen the movie. You know it's pretty gory. I mean, when the, when the red stuff comes, it's, it's, it's not a comedy anymore, right? It, it's Here comes the stuff. So I think what we really did was I think we amped up the action a lot. We amped up the violence. We, we just kind of took everything and turned up the volume on it and kept what I think is, you know, endearing about, about the first one, which is still the, the bickering, the, the playful uh, bickering and banter and, and, and uh, we, you know, still there. It's all, yeah, fun. but it's, it's very much in the works and I, I'm, we're super excited to do it. I mean, I'll it, tell it's, you what, it, I'll tell you what it revolves around. Cause it doesn't give anything away. The movie. So vampires. The, Manson, <laughs> right, vampires. So the Manson brothers, having escaped, uh, you know, to wherever are now broke. They can't wrestle anymore. Um, and they're sitting uh, there and they discover a coven of witches, of hot chick vampires. And the, the hot chick vampires are trying to get a hold of their magic wrestling masks to perform a satanic uh, ceremony on a certain, on Halloween night, of course, because everything has to happen on Halloween to open up a door between the demonic world and our world and the Manson brothers have to thwart it. The two biggest idiots on the planet are now going to save the world for a second time. So, and hilarity. One of the brothers is very upset also that, that they were not given the credit that they deserve for the first go around. Yeah. So, and that will manifest itself immensely. Yeah. So Stone's <laughs> more pissed off and Skull's dumber and... <laughs> so a direct sequel a direct sequel to the first one then it yeah. is a, well it's not I, zombies in it yeah, it's yeah a direct there's no sequel. zombies but but yeah. in the sense but, that it's, yeah, it the happens story. yeah the story continues basically yeah. and we're working on a series you know we'd like to try and pitch a series uh and we have a third film in the works as well that we uh usually what happens is i write the skeleton and then he and i start to figure out all the scenes from there so i'm in the middle of the skeleton on that one right now so we got stuff ready to go. We just need them. Uh, <laughs> uh, the movie comes out uh, on digital VOD and, and everywhere um, September 10th, correct? 10th. September 10th. Right. That's 10th. right. And and select theaters around the country. And then Very if you're in wild. Chicago, if you're in Chicago, it's the music box on the 16th 
of September. Yeah, right. on September 16th, we'll be having a one night only showing. One showing seven o'clock at the Music Box Theater. Uh, you can go online to musicboxtheater.com and get tickets. We'll also have a Q and A afterwards. With uh, as of right now, uh, myself and Mike will be there. We're we're trying to get a few of the other guys to show up as well to have some fun. Um, and then we'll be doing on the 18th in Dixon, Illinois, the uh, Dust Till Dawn Drive-In uh, Movie Theater evening, which is not only the Manson Brothers. But it is um, Texas the Chainsaw. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Silent Night, Deadly Night, and Blood Sucking Freaks. <laughs> so, so. see your movie on a bill with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, I was like, holy crap! I'm and like, to be this- at the music box. I mean, the, you know, I, I, listen. If it all ended tomorrow, uh, that that's kind of that's kind of worth it for for two Chicago guys for sure. We're so appreciative of all the support we've gotten from everybody, yeah, especially and, uh, from you, Lance, and everybody. Yeah, at- yeah. I mean, and and thank you to everybody at Joe Blow who's been awesome to us and arrow in the head. Um, you know, we're really excited. We're we're we're. I, I hope that uh, much like yourself, people, you know, really see what we're going for. And please hit us up on Instagram uh, at Manson Brothers the movie at Real Mike Carey at C Margettis. Uh, at Max Martini LA. And uh, I wanted to also acknowledge uh, to all our veterans out there, uh, active duty also, thank you for your service. Thank and, you so much. Uh, you know, we're, yep. we're appreciative and praying for you. Um, also, you know, it's worth mention- noting that we we have a, a, a lot of veterans on our cast yes. and crew. Um, uh, Mike is, is a, a former, well, no, not a former Marine, you're a Marine yeah, for life when you're a Marine. Yeah. Um, uh, Randy Couture, Dave Meadows, uh, Lewis, um, our yeah. entire stunt crew. Uh, Freddie uh, Joe Farnsworth, Marines. Chad Bennett, Algin yeah. Menendez, Robert Garcia, Dave Hutchins. Chad, by the way, Chad Bennett, who's a, another Illinoisan, another central yeah. Illinoisan to go along. Um, you know, and just a lot of guys on the crew. And it, it's uh, especially now, you know, I think I think even more people Jermaine have appreciation Washington. for it. Yeah, Jermaine Washington. Um, let's not forget about Mike O'Hearn too, even though he's Mike not a veteran, O'Hearn. he's a veteran of a hundred thousand uh, muscle and fitness covers or whatever he is. Our cast um, is so great, but yeah, you know, and it, it was, it was, you she know, when, when you, let me tell you, when you work on a crew of alpha males, um, it, it was, it was pretty cool. Cause everybody, everybody checked their ego and did their stuff. And it was, it was really great, man. Uh Oh,